Well, what's going on, everybody? It is the Rock Shop here with uh, Dave, uh, the Shockwave. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Yeah, we're here. Yeah, here, live, the Rock Shop. Well, today um, is a... Uh, a special show today. Well, it's been a special show because I've had this guest several times already. Um, man, this guy is the founder and guitarist of the band Dark Avenue. I've had this guy here several times. I would like to welcome him once again to take time off uh, his busy schedule, Barry. Of hey, Avenue. what is happening, Dave, and everybody out there in Radio Land? Hey! <laughs> How's it going, man? Hey, it's going just fine. Going really fine, despite the, the nasty weather here in North Texas. Uh, yeah, um, so it's crazy. And, and by the way, first, I want to say thank you very much for having me back. And we, uh, we as Dark Avenue, totally appreciate uh, the support you give us. So. My pleasure. Any Anytime, my friend. So anytime. you mentioned the crazy weather. So I, I had about an hour, hour and 10 minute commute to get over here. And it was crazy. It's like I drove through where the crazy weather had just happened the entire way over here. <laughs> so I never hit the crazy weather. I just hit the crazy traffic and all the wet streets and mayhem after the crazy weather. It was kind of it was weird, but it was you know, I didn't have to drive through the crazy weather. I just had to drive through the madness after the crazy oh, weather. Oh, the madness, yeah, yeah. There's some people out there that are just crazy, crazy, crazy drivers, <laughs> you know. Hydroplaning, uh, you know. Yeah, when it's when it stops raining and all that, then they think it's all fun and games. Uh, so, it's crazy. Yep. Uh, I'm a defensive driver, okay? I'm, I like you, to be offensive. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just so you're aggressive. You're kind of an aggressive. No, I didn't say aggressive. Oh, I oh, say I like to be off, off offensive. <laughs> <laughs> I like to offend as many people with my driving as possible. <laughs> I think my wife would verify that too, <laughs> and probably several other people. Right, especially when they're in your. When they are in your car. Yeah, they're all yeah. huddled up in the back of the truck yeah. going, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> they're all just kind of like cringing and saying, what are you doing, they're man? They're cringing in the back of the truck. They all have like safety helmets on. <laughs> that, that, of course, they have safety helmets might be for an entirely different reason, but <laughs> they have their helmets on and they're all buckled in and huddled up together. Oh, probably, <laughs> you know, saying some kind of chant or prayer that they yeah. get there safely. <laughs> well, you know, um, my father, okay, my father's in his mid-80s, and when I ride with him, he's an erratic driver. First, at one point, he drives really slow. I mean, like, slow as molasses, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, just 40 miles, and like, no, 35. So he's one of the guys I make an, a point to offend as yeah, I'm going yeah, around. Yeah, pretty much, yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But then, but then, all of a sudden... I don't know. Five miles later, he drives like a bat out of hell. All right. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm good know, with that. You know, so and and uh, and when he approaches a traffic light, I mean, he just, I mean, he doesn't stop yet. I said, well, "What are you doing?" And here's my foot. You know, my foot is just like <laughs> right over here, and and I'm I'm getting nervous. Me, <laughs> I'm getting you know really nervous. And what are you doing? You know. Uh, so does he drive like a big old school Cadillac or something? Uh, no, just a Toyota. <laughs> oh, okay, that'd be a great compact, if he like drove some big, huge old like, well seventy four Eldorado. <laughs> well, it's like twenty two feet long. That'd well, awesome. he used to have a uh, uh, a Bonneville. Okay, you know, That's so not in, a small in the eighties, so yeah, and also a big station wagon, <laughs> well, big big station wagon. That's how that's how that's how I uh, started learning my driving with a station wagon. Isn't that the worst? <laughs> my parents had one of those man i would not let them get anywhere near the school if i was in that car i'd make them even if it was a half mile walk a mile walk i'd be like hey dad you can drop me off here i gotta go by joe's house on the way to school i'd make up any excuse to not ever be seen in that car anywhere near the school i don't <laughs> care rain uh -huh. snow 
right. wind, whatever, I'm not being seen in that stupid station wagon <laughs> anywhere near the school. So how? So you were like what? Several feet away from the school, or? Oh or? no! I mean, I would make you were invisible, right? I would make him drop me off. I'm serious, like. It, it, a mile away sometimes. I'm uh-huh. not going to be seen by the kids. <laughs> I got you. Going to school it, and me getting dropped off in that station wagon. I <laughs> detested that thing. It was just, <laughs> oh, my God. When they put, my parents pulled up one day, like, oh, we got a new car. And I opened the front door and I saw it. I just turned around, slammed the door, went back in. I'm like, my high school life is over right now before it ever started. <laughs> Oh my gosh! I, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I, no, and no, to no, make please, it worse, no. it had that fake wood paneling on the side. I'm like, Bruce, they forgot to take it out of the box. He didn't get the joke. Oh, <laughs> oh my it was gosh. awful, dude. It I was bet. Awful. I bet. I bet. Yeah. Um, I did that. Uh, you know, a few times. And I was always heavy on the gas pedal, you know. You gotta be. I mean, I, just because uh, it was, how would I say, uh, scary, scary to do so. So you just, I mean, my foot was just, you know, kind of trigger happy on the gas pedal, you know, just going around in circle in a circle. At, they call uh, those donuts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Making all those spins. And, I, and at that time, a long time ago, I scared my father in the process. All right. So Good now, job. I'm yeah. proud of you. Oh, thank you. And now, now it's his turn when, I'm, when, I, when he's driving. Yeah. Utmost revenge years later. Right. Yeah. And just very quickly, uh, it took me three times before I finally got my, uh, um, you know, license or, you know, li- li- license, license to drive, you know. License first, to ill. First time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. First time. First time was with a uh, constable. Mm-hmm. Oh, I failed parallel parking badly. Don't you hate parallel parking? You know, it's never been a, a big thing with me. I've always just yeah. kind of had it. You know. So I don't in other know words, why, it, I just always did. Just so you do it offensively, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. And, and and so those of you that are listening, if you're familiar with where all the venues are in downtown Dallas and uh-huh. Bellum. Most of the streets are one way there, not all, but most, and the best parking are at the meters on the street. And let me tell you, if I see an open meter, I don't give a rat's backside. <laughs> if I'm blocking traffic for uh, you know 30 seconds, I'm parallel parking in that spot, buddy. You're just going to wait your turn to get by. <laughs> that parking down there in Deep Ellum is ridiculous. So if I there bet. Is a, if I there bet. is a spot at a meter, right. I'm on it. Right. I'm on it. And, and I don't care if I got to pull into head on traffic to back up into it. I don't care. My spot. <laughs> <laughs> you're just going to have to wait. <laughs> just wait. You know, so if I don't part, if I don't do it the first time, hey, you're just going to have to wait. That's I'll all get the, it on the yeah, first try, but yeah. they're going to oh, wait for it. Oh, but they're going to wait for that. Yeah. yeah. I got you. Yeah. So again, you know, I'm just very, very quickly. So I failed. Yep. Automatic. Yeah. Turn that car around, son. Put that in park. <laughs> you failed. Ooh. Gee, you have to talk to me like, oh, no, he's a constable. Never mind. The second time I was with a clerk. So I'm, uh, so I uh, parallel park. And uh, actually, I, I, no, I passed. I passed. But then I had to go now through the, you know, driving through the uh, residential neighborhoods, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. in that area. Mm-hmm. Did that for about five minutes, uh, made one wide turn, too wide of a turn, which could have been an accident, you know, if there was another car coming this way and I may just make too wide of a turn, oh, right. it would have been major impact. Uh, I hit the curb when I parked, you know, in front of somebody's house. I hope nobody was looking when that happened. And uh, then I also made a turn at a light, another wide turn, so looked at the score, and there I still failed. Great. Okay. Jeez. How, how old am I going to be when I get my license? So, uh, this is going to be a long, drawn process. And believe me, I was very impatient. Finally, the third time with a constable, um, I fail it. I failed parallel parking, but I continued the test. Yeah. Strangely enough, I passed, I, I made my turns, stop, uh, get close, you know, not get too close to the curb, making sure that I don't hit the curb. Uh, three rights, three lefts, two rights, two lefts, come back around. And I'm like, I'm so tense. I'm very, very tense. And then he said, congratulations, you passed. I got a 72. Yeah! I mean, right, that's awesome. And really, yeah. 
the the driving part's really the important part, not the parallel parking <laughs> thing. I mean, come on. Why so, it, Why do you think on the test, and still, as far as I know, still does it to this, they still do it to this day. Why do you think that that's the first test? I, I don't know. I know you need it. Right. But, I mean, really, with the Spanish people drive, they really need to not focus so much on the parallel parking as those yeah. of us that are offensive drivers. Correct. And so where I got nailed on my driving test was, of course, slinging the seat back and putting one arm over the steering wheel, <laughs> the other one on the shifter in the console. Uh-huh. And then, of course, having one hand on the steering wheel and reaching for the radio and screwing around with the radio while I'm on my driver's test. <laughs> I passed. But that's where I got docked. Oh, I see. Oh, by doing this? Yes, yes. Wow. So for those of you in Radio Land, it's yeah. flipping your seat back so you're kind of sitting in the back seat <laughs> reclining, and you got your left hand at the top of the wheel, your right hand wow. just kind of casually laid on the console. That. So... <laughs> That's a nice, casual, cool driver. So you're back like, you know, you could have just popped the wheels, you know, in the process and say, look, hey. Which is exactly not what you want to do on your driving test. There was no 10 and 2 at that. That was like straight up 12 o'clock with one hand, the uh-huh. other one, you know, on the console on the armrest, fiddling with the radio. And, <laughs> the, and I just remember that cop looking over at me like, this is going to be a long the- afternoon. <laughs> The cop was cool for you having the radio on? No. no that's he, where I got docked on That's points. where you got, got docked. docked so, you got docked, that. so you got docked with this. Yep. You got docked with the gears. You got docked with the radio. Yeah. And everything else was smooth. Everything else was smooth. Wow. <laughs> I think he laughed about it, though. Uh-huh. I was Eventually, like, I'm sure. <laughs> Come on, dude. You know this is how reality is. Nobody drives around with 10 and 2 and white knuckle in the wheel. Except. Your dad? Yes. <laughs> There you go. My father. But like I said, my father is tense. As I say, he could be driving like this, or he can just have one hand. I mean, I mean, he goes from nervous to confident, from confident to nervous. That's how erratic he is. I mean, right. I, I, you know, I just... Uh, that's my dad. What can I say? No, it's all right. You don't want to be around when my mom's behind the wheel. Trust <laughs> me. You don't want to be in the car. You don't want to be yeah. out of the car. You don't even want to yeah. be in the same zip code <laughs> when she's driving. <laughs> Mom, sorry. You know it's true. She owns the roads, right? Oh, um, no. I'd say she owns you know, the sidewalks, oh, oh, the plants. Oh, everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> wow. Um, but, hey, it took me three times. It, it only took you the first time, right? One time. One time, yeah. For most people, it took one time. For my sister, it took one time. But for me, it took My three. brother took a call. I don't think my brother got his license until he was like 22. Is that right? Yeah, because I... Uh, he he was kind of late to do start into driver's ed for whatever reason. Right. And then he failed it. And then I don't think he was like, well, I don't want to drive anyway. So I, I think maybe it just scared him. Yeah. Um, and then he didn't go back and, and um, do it until uh, I think about the time he graduated college. And realized, oh, I guess maybe I do need to drive. <laughs> Mom can't haul me around everywhere. Right. Can't be carpooling, you know, all this time. Right. So, no, come no. on, dude. You're yeah. 21. Let's get it on. <laughs> well, cool. Um, all right. We talked about driving since the weather. <laughs> since, you know, we, we got into that subject due to the fact of Mother Nature. This you is know? your driving so, ed class. Now, I take, I take it just very quickly since we're still on the subject. You've driven through freezing rain, right? Oh, my goodness, yes. yes. I, I lived in Colorado for several years, so uh-huh. snow and freezing rain, uh, both between here and that lovely freezing rain we get, and the massive amounts of snow living up in the mountains of Colorado. Yeah, I've been through the extremes. Whereabouts in Colorado? I went to college in Durango. Oh, nice. And I lived in Durango for a few years and then nice. lived in the Denver area for uh, a couple of years. Cool. So I had lots of driving in the mountains uh-huh. with snow. And the the most fun part was when I was living up there and planning in a band, and we had an old school bus that was our tour bus that we had converted, and driving that thing in the snow in the mountains, that was a challenge. I can imagine. Yeah. That was kind of scary sometimes. I bet. I bet with the altitude, you know, uh, 
while you were driving. I mean, I'm sure you've experienced some, um, you know, I don't know, nosebleeds or something. I mean, when you're in higher mm-hmm. type uh, uh, altitude, did, did it affect you, you know, uh, uh, quite a bit? Until you got used to it, I guess. Um, I don't know that it affected me a whole lot. When I first moved up there um, right after high school, I was very athletic. I had come from playing – um, high school soccer and gotcha. select soccer, mm-hmm. and I was a, a real into water skiing, and so I, I was in pretty good shape when I moved up there. Because uh, I actually, when I got up there, I joined the the college snow and uh, snowboarding and ski team. Um, so I don't think I had as big a transition with that as mm-hmm. a lot of other people, just because mm-hmm. I happened to be in good shape at that time. Right. Which, now it's maybe not as much, you know, I don't work out like I used to have to work out for that. But, right. but I did know a lot of people that did have issues with the altitude for the first few weeks that they're up there. And, yeah. and Durango is, it's up there, especially, mm-hmm. um, you know, um, if you get up a little bit further in the mountains where Purgatory is, the big ski mm-hmm. resort up there, I mean, you're, you know, well, well, well on your way up there above 10,000 feet. Right, right. You know, lots of things will happen to you, I'm sure. Oh, know, absolutely. Only, until you until you really get used to it. I mean, yep. you know, I'm sure it's uh, when you get to the to the purgatory. I'm sure it's got to be minus something, you know, <laughs> before you start climbing down. Um, what do you call that? Black diamond or something? The black is that what it's called? Um, yeah, they have they word? have um, you know every kind of slope. Of the, the difficult yeah, ones are the, the black diamond, double black diamond slopes. Right. But. That's um, the one that kind of has a slope that it basically just drops goes, off. It just drops like <laughs> like a roller coaster. Drops, yeah. Hey, thanks for coming. Yeah, Wee! <laughs> no, but I do. I you know I do remember. I just like I said, I had an easier transition because I was really into sports and athletics at that time. Right. But you know you do notice a difference. I I remember you know and when I got up there in August, one of the very first things that I did when I got up there was I went mountain hiking, and. I even as good a shape I was in, I was like, oh man, you you still get winded up there until you get acclimated. So right, but uh, I I didn't experience some of the problems that a lot of a lot of people do when they go up from the high altitudes and they're from you know this area where we're just barely above sea level. Yeah, it um it can be difficult for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. So you really have to be in like like you said, you were in tremendous shape before you know you encountered uh you know going through the altitude you know yep and, and dropping down like a roller coaster you know on those uh and those slopes yep. and those ski slopes you know Nick, see i'm afraid of heights and i'm not going to go in one of those <laughs> well put it to you that way uh what do you call those um ski uh i'm sorry i kinda can't even think of the word for it um like the gondolas or the ski lift the ski lift okay. yeah going up the, the ski lift. lift is just scary enough I don't want somebody to just go, you know, rock the chair like this. Hey, 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 don't do don't do that. Oh, uh, thanks for coming. And, now and, you just and, and here I am. Yeah. I'm the offensive one. I'm a, I'm in one of the chairs and I'm the dude back there that's shaking his snowboard and bouncing the whole cable and everybody's bouncing up and down. So I would be the guy that you're up there with. You're like, oh my god, I'm the one causing all the problems. Right, now. right. Um Oh, I'm sorry, I was just trying to get comfortable, folks. <laughs> Well, really? Let me tell you, if you're if you're scared of heights, one thing don't do, mm-hmm. don't go drive a school bus that's been converted to a tour bus <laughs> over like Wolf Creek Pass in the middle of the winter time. Right. Let me tell you, from somebody that's not really afraid of heights, so one side of the pass is kind of multi lanes, kind of wide. The other side mm-hmm. of the pass is really kind of like two lane and not so wide. In, uh, very narrow, right? It's very, it's pretty narrow, and in the winter yeah. time, that can be quite challenging when there's yeah. snow on the road up there. And Wolf Creek Pass always just had, always the chain laws were in effect. And uh huh, man, let me tell you what that is where driving and nerves will come in. Is that I since we've been talking about driving? <laughs> no, we show. we can talk about driving thanks to Mother Nature. That's where we started <laughs> off our show right here, folks. But uh, <laughs> hey, you know we're we're learning uh, more about you know more about you uh, you know driving habits and <laughs> and Colorado and uh, you know hey you know it's it's all good <laughs> you know people people want to know you know they say yeah I can relate every time we yeah. do this it's odd what tangent we go down yes <laughs> yes. 
It's always entertaining. Well, at least I don't know if it is to the people out there in Radio Land, <laughs> but at least to me and you, it's entertaining somehow. This is very entertaining. <laughs> it's really, it is really entertaining. You know, uh, wow. So, uh, how and how long were you in Colorado in in that in that area? Uh, I was in Durango for two two and a half years, and then Denver area for a couple of years. Uh huh. Before making my way back, Texas just called me home. And I, gotcha. I had to come back down here. Gotcha. Um, I I absolutely loved living in the Durango area. wasn't as crazy about living in the Denver area as much, right? Um, but being in the mountains up there in Durango uh, was just amazing because I I really like the outdoors a lot. And yeah, I love hiking, horseback riding, snowboarding. Man, I love snowboarding. Yeah. I was really into rock climbing back then too. Cool and. Um, and I had a four wheel drive, and a, bu- a bunch of my buddies, we were always tooling around up in the in mountains and stuff in our four wheel drives and stuff. So it was always a really good time. I, 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 I absolutely love living in the Durango area. And if you've never been and you're listening, Alter and Radio Land, <laughs> you get a chance to go to really anywhere in the mountains in Colorado, but that southwest corner of Colorado where Wolf Creek and, and um, mm-hmm. Pagosa Springs mm-hmm. and. Uh, Telluride and Durango and Mancos are up there. It's just outstanding whether you go in the wintertime or the summertime. There's just amazing stuff to do in the summertime even up there. Um, you know, we used to um, – how I kind of found out about Durango mm-hmm. and, and even going to college there was when I was in high school – I went and I worked at a summer camp in Mancos, Colorado, which is just outside of Durango. And of all things, I was a trail lead. So I took kids on overnight horseback rides cool. that okay. were in summer camp up there. And uh, so we would go on these one, two, three day rides via horseback. And so I was kind of like a counselor, but I was a trail guide. So okay. um, I would take these kids, you know, and most of them were. You know, junior high, maybe a little bit, you know, younger, middle school, junior high. Okay. Uh, kind of kids that were there for, you know, summer camp. They were there for like two weeks at a time. Would take them on um, trail rides. Anyway, so when we actually got a day off, they would take us into Durango. Because that was really the first, if you want to call it, at that time. It And this isn't all that long ago, but, and it's still not that, you know, it's a small town, but. Um, it was a little bit smaller than it is now, but that was like going to the big city because when we were in Mancos, there's not a whole lot there where the summer camp was. Right. So we were in Durango, and um, that's how I found about out about Fort Lewis College. And then when college time came around, I was like, man, that's really where I want to go. I just love that atmosphere in Durango so much. Very cool. And in the summertime, you... Uh, speaking, you know, uh, weather-wise, um, gorgeous, very, very nice, right? Uh, you, you, yeah. Would you say that the temperatures, like, were in the sixties and the mid sixties at night, or, know, or yeah, maybe it was night, a little cooler? In the night, it would be cool. It might be in the sixties at night, and then in yeah. the day, it might get into the mid eighties. Of course, you'd have those occasional days you get in the nineties or something. Sure, like that. sure. Most of the time, it was in the eighties, and we spent a lot of time. Uh, Purgatory had one of those alpine slides. Yeah. If you've ever done one of those, they are just amazing. If you've never done one, go YouTube what an alpine slide is. <laughs> it's basically like the like almost like a bobsled course that's made out of either concrete or fiberglass, depending on where you go. Gotcha. And you have this little cart. It looks like a little luge cart from the Olympics that you park yourself in, and you go cruise down the mountain in this half-pipe tube. And um, we used to have season pass. We'd go up there every day, and ride the alpine slides for half a day and then go mountain bike for part of the day and stuff up there so yeah it, it, it and dude there's so much stuff to do outdoors in during on the summertime i mean if you like fly fishing there's great fishing up wow. there and there's a lot of little lakes up there um that you can go either fishing or i mean some of them are big enough to go wakeboarding and water skiing and stuff in mm-hmm. Um, there's ra- all kinds of river rafting and stuff. The Animus River goes through the canyon up there, and there's other rivers too. Um, but I mean, so you have hiking and fishing and riding the Alpine Slide and mountain biking and. I mean, if you like the outdoors, that is just a beautiful part of the country to go. I can imagine. There's always some activity that's that you can always do uh, always, there. you know, on a daily basis, as opposed to well, here, you know, 
I mean, yeah, I mean, there's I mean, things there's, to do, but it's, I mean, you don't have yeah. beautiful mountains and mesas. Yes. And, and there's so much history in that part of the country, too. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine. A lot of Native American history there. It's, yeah. And um, one of my favorite things was um, when you get to the more of the, if you will, the flat part of the town. So mm-hmm. if you go one direction, you go up the canyon, you go up towards Purgatory. Gotcha. You kind of go down the other direction. You're sort of heading out of town, sort of towards the airport on your way to New Mexico. And the Animus River kind of, um, it gets real wide there, so the current isn't very strong. And in the early morning, in the late afternoon, you could see the eagles come down, and they would soar above the river and look for fish in the river and they would dive down and grab fish. And it was just a really cool thing yeah. to be able to see that kind of nature uh, just every day where you live. Sure. And um, it was always really cool in the fall. The deer and the elk um, in the early evening would come down out of the mountains because the town is in the mountains. Mm-hmm. And um, they had, everybody had these little trees in their yards up there. They had these little apples or maybe a little bit small, maybe the size of a plum. And the deer and the elk would come down every night. And they would go in everybody's yards and eat these little apples um, off these trees. And so, um, you know, you always, of course, so, you had to be careful, you uh-huh. know, when you're driving at nighttime. And I think everybody that lives there has hit a deer once or twice, at least. I know I, I hit one once when I was yeah. living up there. Um, but it's really cool to have the deer and the elk, you know, come sure. down into your neighborhood, if you will. And, um, well, you, you now of course, most of the time it would be unexpected because, like you said, as far as you know, you're on the road, all of a sudden, oh, yep, you know, that's what most everybody would say. They, they, you know, try to avoid the deer, right? You know, and God forbid you you skid, uh, I don't know, twenty twenty five feet, and of course there has been some bad accidents, oh, un- unfortunately, uh, due due to the deer, you know, because obviously, you know. Deer can't, doesn't <laughs> it just. Yeah, they don't obey the traffic. They, they don't obey the traffic. They're not going to look both ways before they, <laughs> they cross the they, road. They do you not. Know, you know, <laughs> they're going to say this is my road, and I'll just you know. Uh, I'm going across where everyone. So it's it's probably safe to say that if you're in an area, especially in an area where there's a lot of deer and a lot of elk, um, I would assume I'm presuming is there a speed limit. And there's a sign that says, watch for deer, watch for well, elk, there, I'm sure. Yeah, there were a lot of places, you know, especially like on the, um, on the highway going up the canyon. Yeah. And then on the road, like leading from Durango out to the Mancos area or the road leading down to Farmington, New Mexico. Right. There were a lot of deer crossing signs because those were the common spots that deer would cross. Right. But like in the neighborhood areas, they didn't have any deer crossing because it was just, they were there. Just kind of like, I don't know if you've ever been to san antonio yeah a lot of the suburbs you know the deer just come through the suburbs and i actually my brother-in-law lives out in azel on the west side of town here Mm -hmm. and at night you know they're out there by eagle mountain lake and the deer just traipsing through the neighborhood at nighttime you know because we've somewhat encroached on their territory um obviously invaded their territory yeah (laughs) but you know just around um you know some of the the town the the town in, in durango the there's kind of some mesas that overlook town. Uh, those n- neighborhoods, that, I mean, they didn't have deer crossing signs there because everybody knew deer was there. Right. But on the highways in, the, in those common areas, they, they definitely had the, the warning signs. And right. They were there. That's where I, mm-hmm. I, I hit one one morning was um, dropping somebody off at the airport and then coming back, and it was just about sunup time, and that's when they were running. And sure enough, I come around the corner, and there was one. And fortunately... Didn't damage my car bad and didn't damage the deer too bad. She got up and ran, licked her wounds and ran off. It ran so, away, huh? Wow. Wow. That's, so, that's, we've covered. Yeah, we, we have covered a bad <laughs> weather and driving and into uh, na- uh, nature itself, nature. <laughs> encountering deer and elk in a good way and not so good way. And God forbid you don't want to be impacted and you yeah. have been impacted. And, and um, I think the, the Durango Chamber of Commerce now owes me a check for advertising <laughs> for, the, for the Tourist Society or something. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Since I've been sitting here promoting Durango, Colorado. <laughs> right. <laughs> Make sure you cut them a good check, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Please be sure that, oh, yes, that, you're, and, that you're doing and, so. And I, I think the uh, people at Fort Lewis College should... You know, 
Yeah. <laughs> Give yeah. me a little back, a little bit of that tuition. Uh, nice. Uh, don't worry. They'll pass worry. the basket. So, yep. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're at the top of the hour listening to KDUX Web Radio broadcasting live from Richland College in Dallas, Texas. You are currently tuning in to a special segment of The Rock Shop with Dave the Shockwave and the founder and guitarist of Dark Avenue, Barry. Yeah. All right. What is up? Wow. <sighs> Let's talk music now, yeah. shall we? <laughs> just no, this was very that. cool. I mean, yeah. I love the, the the driving and everything else. I mean, you, you know, this is this is cool. But let's go ahead and talk music. I don't yeah. know. I don't know if you've heard this. Um, I just got this information um, just a couple of days ago. But my favorite band of all time is calling it quits. Kiss. Yes, sir. I don't believe it. Yes, sir. It says after. I'm just gonna read a few, yeah, a few, read a few lines here. It says uh, Kiss announces the what's called the final ever road, final ever tour. Excuse me, end of the road after four decades, 45 years in the business. They are finally saying goodbye, and I bet Paul Stanley was the one that made the announcement. Uh, they were at the NBC's. I don't know if you see that show called America's Got Talent. I've seen it once or twice. I've seen it once or twice, too. So Kiss came on stage, and they sang Detroit Rock City. Well, the the younger crowd was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, they had some pyrotechnics and everything going on. And everybody's like astonished. Woo, yeah. But I know that they don't know anything about Kiss. They're just, <laughs> they're just, they're just cheering not because of the band. They were just cheering because... Okay, you did some really cool things here. Let's fire. Yeah, fire. yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, so, but they were there in America's Got Talent. America's Got Talent. So that's how they kicked it off that night. I guess it was the uh, that whatever episode or whatever day it is. So they did the stellar performance of Detroit Rock City. Well, to me, it wasn't quite stellar. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't quite st- because they they had to cut because due to time constraints they had to cut off like 45 seconds of the song. I understand um, that. You know, so uh, then Paul Stanley introduced this judge. I don't remember. I don't remember her name. Uh, I don't know her anyway. But he just did that, and then and then all the judges were like clapping and doing all that, and then they got to the end of Detroit Rock City. So uh, they have not revealed yet their tour dates. Uh, they promised it will be a tour to remember. It better be for any rock band for, for for that matter. It better be so. Anyway, um, you know, and he goes on to say, Kiss Army, we're saying good on our final tour with our biggest show yet, and we'll go out the same way we came in, unapologetic and unstoppable. Absolutely. Uh, goes on with past members of uh, Kiss, you know, Ace Frehley, yeah, the mm-hmm. guy of guitar, that's always going to be the guy of guitar, I'm sorry, he is ranked number one. And uh, <laughs> yeah, much to a lot of people that will disagree with that, but to me, he's number one. Uh, Peter Chris, Eric Carr, Vinnie Vincent, Mark St. John, and Bruce Kulick, they were all members. They've cut about 20 albums, 8 live albums, 13 compilation albums, and over 60 singles. Uh, they've been inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2014. And uh, they performed at the Super Bowl Winter Olympics, Family Guy, and American Idol. And um, so, anyway... Basically, he's saying um, he does not want to leave, you know, his true home of the band itself, but he wants to spend more time with his family, and that and that is perfectly understandable. Even though Paul Stanley is now sixty six years old. So what did, what did they say they, about the 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 other prior members like Peter Chris? Oh yeah, what uh, were they saying? Uh, what it says pa- past band members included. Oh okay, yeah. they just mentioned. They that. just mentioned. They, they didn't just say mentioned that they're going now, to n- make appearances. Or mm, no, not so much. no. Um, the the final tour is going to be Paul Stanley, Gene Simmons, the original members, mm-hmm. and then the two the other two that are wearing the yeah the, the imposters the imposters. Uh, that's what I like to call. Uh, their makeup, you know, yeah. which I, I'm sorry, I, that that makes me mad. It really de- just deliberately. But anyway, Tommy Thayer is wearing Ace Frehley's makeup, right. and Eric Singer is wearing Peter Chris's makeup. So these are the guys that are gonna, you know, conclude the tour whenever it starts. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't know. I, you know what, you know, I, I really don't know if uh, Peter Chris and Ace Frehley may may uh may show up i have i have no idea um, uh, i would bet not unfortunately i i think it would be a great hat tip to those guys because kiss wouldn't be where they are today without them right 
But also knowing how KISS has operated for the last umpteen years, I bet you they don't extend the invitation to Peter Chris and, and right. um, Ace Frehley as they should. Um, well, interesting. I, I I can believe it and I cannot believe it. Um, you know, they really haven't churned out anything new of merit in a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. 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 However... I do know how much, especially Gene Simmons, likes to be in the public eye and the fact that he is quite the entrepreneur and likes to make money off of the KISS brand. Yes, yes. Um, So I have a hard time believing that this would be the final uh, thing of KISS. Sure. Um. Unless they make this, like, like oh, is it Elton John that's like on his third year of his last tour? Exactly. <laughs> you know, so it's just like the never-ending tour, but it's still <laughs> the final tour, but it just never ends. Right. Um, well, were you you were aware that back in two thousand, when they when the original me- well when the original members regrouped in nineteen ninety six. Or they reformed, they, you know, they reunited, excuse me. They, they let re- him take a picture yeah. with them, with yeah. Gene Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and supposedly, they were going to announce that that was going to be uh, the, the, final fi- the final tour. Yeah. And I was there, and I saw the the original members, except when Peter Chris said, thank you, Houston, we love you, when they were here in <laughs> Dallas. Oops. And the crowd, I, I yeah, kid you, you not. Don't. you don't. They, oh, they yeah. were upset. Yeah. They were. And Paul Stanley, boy, he defended him really well. He just said... Hey, <laughs> he, he he said he meant to say Dallas. He's a little tired, right. something like that. You know, I I get that, but but um, so anyway, supposedly that was going to be the final tour, but no, no, I I didn't believe it. I still didn't. I I, I you know I didn't believe it. That's all I got to say. Yeah, but I, I don't. know. I guess we'll see. But I just have a sneaking suspicion. Probably not. Just like I I. My gut tells me that this Slayer tour that's supposed to be their farewell tour, my gut tells me no. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, those guys live to tour. And yeah. And everything you read about them, they really enjoy what they do. Absolutely. I just have a sneaking suspicion that this may not. And I know Slayer extended this this final tour and added a bunch more dates. My gut tells me it's not going to be the final tour. Right, right. And same thing with Motley Crue. That as of two years ago, um, well, the major concert that I that I attended with Alice Cooper. But, right. But uh, they said it, that all bad things must come to an end. Tour was gonna was gonna be their final tour, which I I find uh, I kind of find it hard to believe uh, as well because I I really do believe that they're still gonna. They're they're going to reunite probably another couple of years or so. Now Kiss is a lot older. The members are That's a lot true. older than lot the members older. of of Motley Crue. Yep. So uh, I I find it hard to believe that Motley Crue is going to call it quits. Um, but um, I am not surprised at this time because they are in their sixties. Well, Gene is probably near seventy years old. Paul just said he was sixty. Well, didn't say, but according to a source here, says he is sixty six. And these other two guys probably in their fifties already. Uh, you know, um, so I, I, uh, I believe that. So, um, it's, kinda, it, it, but know, it's it, possible. Yeah. It is sad. It's sad. Um, you know, because it's my band's more is my favorite band. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, Paul Stanley's not going to be, a, I'm sure he's a grandfather, you know, so he's going to be a grandfather yeah, to I, his grandkids. I, I you know, I, I just don't know how, how much quality time that he spent with, you know, his wife and his kids. But he wants to make sure that he is the granddaddy of, you know, his grandkids. Sure. You well, know. so that's, I mean, that's how I look. Not at. like he doesn't have a good retirement plan. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Man, talk about a battle band that's made a lot of money. <sighs> and And very little of it from <sighs> records and touring. All of it's been from... Investments and in, in Merchan- merchandising, merchandising 
very, very, very heavily. Man, I know um, while you were and Andrew Kings. were here, you know, a few months ago, you know, we kind of talked about, you know, some of the collections of the merchandise. Yep. Uh, you know, that he had, I had, you had like a kiss dispenser. You still have that to this yeah, day? Yeah, I right? have like a, in fact, <laughs> I came across it the other day. I have a kiss Pez dispenser. Yeah. That I was standing in line in Walmart. Gosh, it's probably been five, six years ago, and they had them. There's around Christmas time. I'm like, oh, I got to buy that. That'll be worth something someday. Right. It was like 10 bucks. you know? Why not? It was really cool. I mean, it came with this little tin case for them, and, <laughs> and it's a Kiss Pez dispenser. <laughs> Come on. It's yeah. a freaking Pez it's dispenser. A Pez, yeah. Can you, ima- can you imagine, you know, um, <sighs> They had lunch boxes. They had thermoses. Yeah. Um, other than, of course, you know, kid, you know, kiss cards and you know all Everything. of the all of these collectors' items. But they wanted to appeal to the masses of the of the kids, you know, as well. Yep. You know, uh, much of the chagrin of Ace Freely, he didn't like that whatsoever. Yeah. But that's another that's another issue there. But but that, like you said, that is how they made. Tons. I mean, tons and tons of revenue, tons of revenue on based based on that. You know, their Dump image trucks full of hundred dollar bills. Uh, uh, <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, again, on the one hand, I'm I'm sad. But, uh, you know, on the other hand, yeah, it's you know, it's time. You know, it may be time. Like I said, they yeah. really haven't put out anything of merit. Right. In a long, long time. Right. And. Right. The last time I saw them, I can't, I don't even remember when it was. It's been a while. And I was like, oh, boys, you're not sounding so good. Yeah. And, yeah. um, yeah. There were a couple of instances, uh, I think of the last tour, uh, Paul Stanley, um, fainted. And, uh, so he, uh, yeah, there was one show that he just literally, even before the show started, he said something. I can't, I can't remember. Maybe he said, are you ready for Kiss? Are you, ready? you know, uh, the hottest band in the land. Well, somebody usually says that before Paul Stanley does. But then he fainted. And, uh, um, you know, the ambulance obviously was there. Uh, they, 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 they took him to the hospital. And they went ahead and continued the show with the, with the remaining three members. I think I remember seeing some video of that because I remember Gene standing up at the microphone saying, you know, something had happened to Paul. And, yeah. Um, I think I remember that. Yeah. And, um, it, it, uh, and you know, the, and that was like on a, like a home DVD thing or something. But I remember catching it on, on some show on, on television. And right. It, um, to me, it when Gene was at the microphone talking about it, and I understand you need to address the crowd and let them know what was going on. Right. It was very, to me, it took away kind of the rock god image that you had of Kiss because it made him look like a mere mortal. Yeah, the way he presented himself when sure, that happened. Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, um, you know, I don't know if you've seen that footage or not, but I would have been like, you know what? I'm sorry, Paul's had an issue. Show's canceled. Mm. And I wouldn't have gone up there, uh, at least me, and kind of, I don't know. You'd have to just see it to understand. Sure. And it was just odd to me that... Um, the way that he presented it and the way that it was presented in that video package. Um, I, and I understand the show must go on sometimes and, and right. we've had situations like that too, but it was just, it was really weird because it really took away. It was the complete opposite of what their image is and what they've always um, projected themselves to be. Right. So that's why I think it struck me odd. Mm-hmm. Is it, it was everything opposite of what they've always projected mm-hmm. themselves, um, and I think that's why, it's, like I said, why it struck me so odd that they did that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and it was really just mainly Gene and his the way he was communicating and verbalizing, and it it didn't make me believe he was this big seven foot tall demon anymore. It was just like this. 
you know, yeah. dude from Long Island <laughs> talking to me with some makeup on. Right, right. It, it was really weird. Um, like yeah, like it. you said, the 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 band was struck as their their image of like immortality, and it they they really struck it rich internationally, especially in Australia and in Japan in those in those foreign countries. Boy, they adored them. Oh, absolutely, you know? still do. While while they while in the beginning, of course, they struggled here in domestic, you know, right here in the states. Yep. But they were just, I mean, unbelievably uh, popular extremely extremely popular and i really don't think that those people there especially in australia and and in the far east were there because they really knew their music and if their music was really they're rocking out to the songs they were just rocking out because they were just an, an immortal type of band you know you, you yeah, see you, you know it, you know what i mean um it's it's not so much musically that they're you know, oh yeah, man, yeah, I like this song. Do you know that? Um, because if you were to ask anybody if you were gonna head over to those countries, they would just—I would think that they would tell you, yeah, man, the, yeah, the guy with the makeup and sticks his tongue out, yeah. <laughs> but do you know? But do you know the song um, "Detroit Rock City"? No, probably well, not. You know, you touched on something really interesting right there, uh -huh. and it, it was somewhat true back then and it's still somewhat true today yes the fact that they were huge outside the united states so think about it think about look where judas priest cut their first live album japan look where uh cheap trick cut their first live album japan yeah um it's amazing how many and it's really kind of very true today how many great American bands actually do well outside of the United States? Right, and it's and it's really true these days too. It is just so weird that it's American music. People love American music, but you struggle here in the states. You get out of the states, go to South America. Yeah, American rock and metal is just massive down there. You go to exactly. Europe, and it's massive. You go to yeah. to to Japan and Korea and China. Yeah, and it's massive. Yeah. But what the double H E double <laughs> hockey sticks is going on here, people? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe because we here the states pass too much judgment, or or is it? Uh, here's another band, <clears throat> Coldplay. They are, well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I didn't say I was. I, I didn't say I was a fan of Coldplay. I'm just going to say this: they are extremely huge in Europe. Okay, <laughs> to five. Uh, what is it? To 500,000 people with a just a piano and a couple of dudes and really, you know, I. Uh, I'm just saying. I don't know. I, I in the other words, forty-year-old virgin had great <laughs> quotes about that band. I'm not going to repeat them on the air, right. but the forty-year-old virgin had qu great quotes about that band. <laughs> if you've not ever seen that movie, just go watch it. You'll see. Right, right, right. Their documentary. Um, so, but uh, you, you were talking about Judas Priest, and you were talking about uh, you know some other some other. Oh, well, there's so many other bands. I mean, I, Iron Maiden. My God. I mean, you never hear them. Maybe occasionally an octane here in the states, but you go overseas or South America or to Asia. I mean, the guys can't even be seen in public; they're so huge, right. and they've been doing this for forty something years themselves. Right? You know, right? And it, it's just—I mean, they own they they own their <laughs> own seven forty seven. Those aren't cheap, <laughs> right? And fly that thing around the world, you know to play because they're so popular around the world right and you know even look at look at all right let's pick somebody new avenge sevenfold uh-huh very popular here look at how popular they are outside of the united states even it's just amazing and yeah i, I mean i love seeing the success for them because i love that band i think they're phenomenally talented and and do some really cool stuff but i mean you know, they're only into this a couple of years, you know, a few years ago, and they're already at the top of like the AM Ring Festival and and Download Festival. And of course, now 
obviously they're an A-lister now. Right. You know, and they are the main draw for so many of the huge, huge European festivals. Right. And, um, I mean, it's great to see, but it's just, uh, but I would like to see that here, you know? Sure. And, and why is it that, yeah, everybody here loves rock music. Yeah, they like pop music. They love country music. But yeah, where's the massive followings but, here that it, they have in Europe? That's right. Maybe because I think these charts, you know, these billboards or these people are, you know, putting a, uh, uh, you know, top 10, top 20, top 30, you know, songs and albums and what have you. And I don't know if people are agreeing more or are uh, basically they they agree with more of the uh, of the ratings system and they're not really. Uh, say, hey, man, why don't you just check out this band and hear their stuff and, you know, um, bring your friends and, you know, make it make it a, uh, 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 you know, draw a bigger audience. But maybe because of these ratings and then judgments being passed so quickly that uh, people are going to say, oh, well, OK, I blame it on consultants in corporate media. Ah, There you go. Yeah, exactly. I think we've had this discussion we've had this before. discussion before. Yes, we have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I know there's somebody uh, listening that right now he's like, "Yeah, I agree." Because <laughs> he and I have had this discussion many times. Yeah, yeah. And just very quickly, um, the big four that is huge in Europe, Slayer happens to be one of them. Absolutely. I think it, you're going to know the other three that I'm talking about. Oh, absolutely. Megadeth, mm-hmm. uh, Metallica. Mm-hmm. And uh, Anthrax. Yep, one of my favorites. And I saw the documentary while they were, I believe, I'm going to say in Germany. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say Germany. Germany sounds good. Yeah, that's about right. The raucous crowd that was just, you know, of great anticipation of these bands. And when they come on stage, it was just, mm, you know. Um, yeah. I, I mean, know, that's you go that, and you watch these videos of these festivals in europe and there's like a hundred thousand people there and they're just right going insane for these bands and then you know you come here ah uh. and now granted there are a few festivals here in the united states that that kind of stuff happens at right but not like what's happening over in europe not at all right exactly exactly or South America. I'm, my God, some of those festivals they have in South oh, America are huge. Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. You know, 250,000, 500,000 people that's crazy. at a concert. That's crazy. What? That is crazy. But, hey, it's uh, that's the type of crowd that you need to have. Yeah. You know? To show the uh, the aggression, you know, with you know, to go along with the uh, with that rock music and the offensive yeah. driving, you play yeah. your music loud while yes. you drive offensively. <laughs> <laughs> right on, man! Right on, tied it all together. <laughs> right on. Oh wow, man! <laughs> We're here with Barry of Dark Avenue. How's it going, everybody? Yeah. Wow! In case you didn't know, yeah. I'm Barry. That's Dave. Hey, <laughs> the Shockwave it. here. It's the Rock Shop. <laughs> That's Barry. I'm Dave. Man. So you have an upcoming show this Sunday. We do. This Sunday night. Um, first of all, let, yeah, let's talk about a couple of things here. Let's do. I, I, don't, I don't recall that we've had the previous discussion. Um, your latest album, Reality. Reality. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Wow. Oh, man. Um, let's see. Um you had a song that you played off the set the last time that I was there at uh, at oh, where was it <laughs> the Curtain Club? Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I, I can't remember the name of it. I'm going to say it starts with an M. Madman. Madman. What a great song! Thank you very much. What a great. What we've a great... gotten amazing response for that song. Mm -hmm. um, we pulled that. So we we kind of pulled that out under the radar. Back in early May at the Curtain Club, um, which we used as kind of a warm up to our headlining spot at Rocklahoma. And we had that song in the middle of the set in Rocklahoma, and the place was already electric, and it just went crazy when we played that song. We were just blown away uh, by the reaction that we got to it. And it's been like that every time we've played it, and um, it's I don't know what it is about it, but I'm happy. I love it. I love to see 
people's reaction like that. And I know as a, as um, a band, that's actually one of our favorite songs to play. We, um, and, and it's, I think because there's so much energy in the song and the people feed off that energy and they throw it back to us. And right. It just, it's really cool. And thank you for, for appreciating that. Absolutely, man. It's great. It is fantastic. And just like your previous albums, I know we've had you know this discussion you know several times, but but just to just to reiterate, and for those of you that are just tuning in for the very first time, okay, uh, okay, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I do voice characterizations really well. I'm in an acting class, folks. Okay, another story. <laughs> um, uh, so you uh, again, you do not develop any particular formula like what most other bands do. Uh, you you write what comes immediately to your mind and what's in your heart and what's in you know um, you just go out there you just do uh, you know just come out with a song record it and bam you have it um, would would I say that this album reality has basically the same connotation as your previous albums um yes and um, like illusions um, it is. Um, l- a um what's the right word here um lightly a concept album like illusions was lightly a concept album mm-hmm. um all the subject matter fits into the into the title reality like everything that we did on illusions fit into the title of illusions and and it all tied together okay um if you will is is a Think of it as uh, of uh, illusions was a collection of short stories, if you will. Right. Reality, sort of the same way. Okay. Um, we we kind of thought about it and and approached it like that. Okay. Um, but again, what you said, we do not write our songs with a formula in mind. Um, we write what we feel at the time and if it develops into something it develops into something if it doesn't Mm -hmm. it doesn't Mm -hmm. um but oftentimes we know when when we first jam those first couple of riffs and we're like okay cool we hit the recorder right then and there because we want to make sure we capture everything we got Mm -hmm. and then we'll jam it a couple of times and listen back and go okay cool and then we'll record that and and then we'll stay at that song. Maybe that's the only song we, we play that night at rehearsal. Or maybe like, you know what? Cool. We captured this really cool idea we had. Let's do what we came in to do. And when we come in tomorrow night, we'll revisit it. I does see. It, does it hold water? Yeah, it holds water. Cool. Let's work on it. So um, we don't sit down, you know, and, and you know, a lot of times um, singers will have – already pre-made lyrics and you write the song around the lyrics and stuff right, like that right that doesn't happen to us at all mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. you know mario will often um ad-lib lyrics as we're writing the song and that's part of the reason we'll record it too because he might have an idea lyrically too that we want to capture um as well as us you know we might be doing something cool some kind of cool riff or something mm-hmm. um but more often than not when Mario and I get into the recording studio to lay the vocal tracks down, that's really where the final versions of the lyrics will come from. Right. Um, he spends a lot of time developing what he, what he wants the song to be about once we've written the song. And then when we get in the studio, he'll sing it bar by bar, line mm-hmm. by line. Mm-hmm. One, does it, does it what I'm singing fit the song does it you know is it really giving the impact that it needs and does it you know uh say something does it translate what he wants the message of the song to be does it does it translate correctly okay and so it, it's really kind of unique um that the way that we do that um where the, the really the final version of the lyrics isn't done until we're actually recording the song line by line mm-hmm. and we will mm-hmm. often go through and he may sing a line and then we'll go through and maybe record a couple more lines and then go back and go, you know what? I don't like the way I did line number two. I want to change that. And then he'll erase what he had written down and rewrite it. Um, maybe either for the way that he can sing it to have more impact mm-hmm. uh, phonic, phonetically. Um, or maybe what he's trying to say in the song after he actually sang it and heard it, he's like, you know what, maybe I can do something better with it. Um, so it's, it's really neat the way that he does that. But um, And then again, that's part of the um, 
we do what we feel at the time when we do it. Yeah. And um so it's it's almost like um it's almost like writing a composition paper for some reason. Now it's mm -hmm. just it's just something that I had just have in mind. It's like uh you develop all these ideas, you know, you just kind of brainstorm. Yep. So you brainstorm and you put all these words, you know, and you're having all this together, say, hmm, okay, which what what is this gonna work? You know, how is this gonna you know? And then of course then you start to uh develop, you know, you, like you were saying, to develop the song, to develop the lyrics, and then you write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and revise and revise until 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 you piece it together until it comes out, you know, the yep. way it, to 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 every to everybody's uh, uh, satisfaction. But yeah. at the same time, you don't you don't try to put too much thought into it, right? No, we don't. Um, so, like when when we develop the song. So say we came in and we had the idea. Okay, cool, we got it. Mm -hmm. And then over the next few weeks, we're gonna go through and we're going to establish, you know, like, okay, we feel this part should, you know, go go here. This right. part should go this long or whatever until we have, you know, a foundation. Now, as far as you know, because you have to at least have the foundation before you can go and record it. So once we have the foundation, we'll go and record that. Then we'll go. And we'll all listen to that those recordings, and Mario will start working on lyrics, and then Andrew and I will start. Um, okay, I've got my scratch tracks down. Right now, I'm going to go through, and I'm going to listen and, and and really think about what I want my full track to be, or any overdubs I'm going to be. And and so again, this is all done in the studio as we do it, and we're very fortunate that we had the luxury to have our own studio where we can go in and do that. Cool. Um, because I think it lends to the creative process to be able to go in, lay something down, everybody take a listen to it for a couple of days and go, you know what, yeah, that's right on the mark. That's ex That sounds perfect right there. Or, you know, I like that. Let's see what else we can do in that part. You know, Barry, hey, try, 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 you know, we'll save that track, but try something completely different mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. or Andrew man that's a really cool take mm -hmm. let's try something di different on the next take mm -hmm. and um, go back and then we'll listen to all those and um, it's it works well for us to not have a formula and to you know really play from the heart and what we're feeling at that time mm -hmm. right right um, I know we talked about this um, in the very, very beginning. Um, but does it, do I have a call? No, I do not. <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing, I hear, yeah, I, yeah. I hear it, somebody uh, yeah, ringing. I, I, in I the... thought, I thought, I thought for a second we actually had a caller here. <laughs> oh man. Come on, man. Really? <laughs> yes. You can call yeah, us yeah. at 911. Yeah. No, don't do that. No, don't, no, 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 no. Just we meant, kidding. We meant four one one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm going to talk to Dave and Barry on the Ray J. Uh, what Just number did you like? <laughs> He's actually talking to some some uh, guy on an eighteen wheeler on the CB is actually <laughs> is actually placing the call and it's actually working right now. <laughs> hey, it's just a. <laughs> say, I like your show, man. <laughs> it is cool. Barry and Dave on the show. Yeah. I'm going to let every other trucker know about it right now. I'm going to change it to the CB of Channel 9 to Channel 13. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's what we thought. Uh. <laughs> no, well, I was going to mention... Um, I don't know if it, it, it if if that matters uh, to you as far as the length of the songs. Um, uh, That's a really good question. So, yeah. when we write the songs, um, we just write them. In right. fact, "Madman" is one of the longest songs we have ever written. Mm -hmm. um, without ever intending to write a song for radio length, um, a lot of our songs happen to come close naturally to radio length um now what you'll find often um and you'll find this on illusions and you're going to find this on reality too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is there going to be album versions and radio versions of the songs um unfortunately with commercial radio um they 
have constraints that they put you under, and we have to often fit into those constraints. We sure. never write a song intending to do that. Right. We write the song how we want it, and then if we can adapt it to a radio version, we will. After the fact, we never go in intending to write one uh, radio length. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a very interesting question that you bring up like that. Um, we've we've never sat down and intentionally done that. Mm -hmm. um, that always comes after the fact. After we've done the song, it's been completed the way we want. We're like, okay, can we go back and make a radio version of this song mm -hmm. without taking away from the song because that's the biggest thing to us right, is we right. don't want to take away from the song and that's one of the things that we're we're working with on madman right now um is because we've been asked to make a radio version of that song so we're trying to see if there is a way that we can do that without taking away from the heart of that song. Yeah, absolutely. Without without trying to hinder it, you know, because Yeah, cuz we're, be, we're yeah, yeah, we're not going to release it. If it if the song loses what it's about and the feel that it has, we're not going to it's going to stay the album version and, sure. and and so be it. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's just it like you said it's it's difficult to take, you know, a a, a song and then try to chop it off and not make it yeah it, or somebody you know. tell you your song has to be three minutes and 18 seconds long uh, yeah. uh, i mean i couldn't i couldn't even imagine going in with a mindset of writing based on i have to be aware of my minute and second mm -hmm. counter every time i'm writing a note on this song and there's people that do that that's not us right now can we make a song fit into that absolutely but that's not our goal at first. Our goal is to write a meaningful song that people like. Right. And then if we can adapt it to radio, we will. Exactly. Which we've been, you know, fortunately we've been successful with that as well. But that's never been our first intent. Our first intent is to write from the heart. Absolutely. And to write what people want to hear. Right. Exactly. Man. Day the Shockwave, the Rock Shop here with Barry of Dark Avenue, the founder and guitarist uh, of the band. Now, um, you have just recently, is it recently, maybe a few weeks ago, or maybe a, a little longer than that, um, signed with a new label. Is that correct? Yes, we did. Okay. So, Can you please uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about so, that? Yeah, so first you touched on, we have the big show Sunday night. With now, it just so happens to be our label mates, the band Eve to Adam. Which, oh, man, they're a killer band. Their last record, Locked and Loaded, is just great. It's got, you know, they had a big hit with that song Immortal off of it. Well, so Sunday night we're playing with Eve to Adam. And as about two weeks ago, we became label mates with Eve to Adam. They signed to, they switched labels and signed to Curtain Call Records. I think the same day or the day before we signed with Curtain Call Records. Is that right? <laughs> is. So that's just pure coincidence. It is just pure pure coincidence. Wow. And um, uh -huh. and just how super stoked and cool uh, was that? Wow. And we had been we had been talking to Curtain Call for for a little bit before that. Uh huh. Um, and it just so happened that and we had already had this show booked with Eve to Adam, which we were excited to to play because those guys are a great band. Um. And it, it it just so happened that they signed with Curtain Call Records pretty much at the same time. And then also in that same week, Curtain Call signed the Dead Daisies to the same, you know, to, to Curtain Call Records, too. So wow. They had a big week that week. I can imagine. And, um, yeah. It was pretty cool for us to land some pretty cool label mates like that. Um, so we're really, really super excited um, for what's coming with Curtain Call Records and uh, to be able to release reality with Curtain Call. And that's part of the reason why, you know, we've been teasing this is coming, this is coming, this is coming. Well, all good things to those who wait. So it just so right. happened to work out that um, when we release this, it will be through Curtain Call Records, and it's and it's going to have major distribution, and it's just all... All the cards fell together for this. Wow, man. That's fantastic. Congratulations Thank you. on the signing with the label. Um, 
like you said, you had, uh, Eve to Adam, Eve to Adam, right? Eve to Adam. Did I say that correctly? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Eve to Adam, and uh, wow, it, it's just a pure, pure, pure coincidence. Pure coincidence that's, is yeah. awesome. That's great, man. And um, yeah, and we're super excited to be playing with them Sunday because, like I yeah. said, this, this show was already booked months before uh, the finalization of the deal with Curtain Call, and. Um, you know, so we were already excited to play with those guys because they're they're you know they're a great band. They have a new single. In fact, I think there's their yeah their new single came out today, uh, and their new record's getting ready to come out as well. And, yeah. Um, and like I said, I I love their last record, man. Um, it's got some great tracks on it, and even their the single that was on that record, um, Immortal. Um, the very first time I heard it, man, I remember I was in abilene and i and driving through abilene which by the way has a really cool rock station out there 108 and was driving through abilene i think maybe we were even on a on a west texas tour run head on rock 108 and you know um heard the song and i'm like who is that so I, of course i had to do the shazam or sound hound or whatever right and Eve to Adam, I'm like, oh, man, I've heard of those dudes. And then I go and I download the record. I'm like, oh, this record's great. And then that song takes off. And those guys are huge. And uh, so I have, I have a lot of mad respect for those guys. Right. Good dudes, good band. Got a great sound. Awesome, man. I noticed that you have a, a uh, you, you really appreciate a lot of these, these local bands, so the local rock, especially Gemini Syndrome is oh, yeah. one. Uh, Messer, yeah, I believe is an, is another one. So um, you know, a lot of lots and lots of these uh, uh, rock bands. So Eve to Adam, Dark Avenue, two other bands are going to be on hand Sunday night uh, Sunday as night. well. Uh, I believe uh, Gas a Monkey in Dallas, Texas. Gas Monkey Sunday night, Sunday night. It's a Sunday night, not Friday night, not Saturday night. It's Sunday Fun Day. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be a great show on Sunday. Come see and, Dark Avenue after church, people. Yeah, it'll be, a little, yeah, a little later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little, it'll be a little later, you know. So, so we uh, have uh, Waves of Chaos and uh-huh. Westbound Revival uh-huh. uh, that are also going to be on the bill. And um, I have not gotten to see those other two bands live yet. This will be the first time to see them. And I know, um, I believe it's Westbound Revival's coming in from uh, Little Rock. Yeah. Um, I believe it's where they're based out of. So I'm excited to see them because, you know, we do play in Arkansas. Right. And uh, that might be really cool. Somebody to team up with when we come out that way. So and I don't know if you got to see the announcement that came out around 12 o'clock today. OK. Um, we will be playing with the famed. I guess they got their start in the 80s metal band Striper at Gas Monkey Live on October 16th. And that one just came out of nowhere yesterday. Came out of nowhere yesterday, and they had made the official announcement around noon today. Wow. And um, I remember in my younger years, um, I go, who is this band, Striper? Because I, I remember the first song I heard, I think, was uh, that song, To Hell With The Devil. Oh. And oh, um, wow. I was like, and I always thought their guitar work was pretty cool, and they did a lot of harmony yeah. guitar work. So as a guitar yeah. player, that kind of stuck out to me. Yeah. And so now I'm kind of like you know when we got to open with uh, open for Queensrÿche, I'm getting to play on the stage with a band that I listened to when I was coming up, you know, which was one of the ones when you know I was, you know, figuring things out in life. <laughs> you know, one of those bands you listen to when you're young. Sure. And now you get to share the stage with them, so it's gonna be kind of cool. Yeah. Kind of cool. Well, first, let me show you this. Look at that. Ah, oh, he's got you a see, striper I got, tattoo. I got a striper tattoo, right the on. seven. Okay. And you know what it stands for? Salvation, the redemption, yielding peace, encouragement, and righteousness. Very good. What a band. Very now, good. You know, sometimes they don't want to be labeled as a Christian rock band, but they're labeled as a rock band that sends out a different message that they portray to the audience. Yeah, and see, that's one thing I always thought of them as, it's yeah. just a rock band, and... So, you know what's really kind of crazy? So, I'm tooling around on Amazon Prime a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And, dude, there are some amazing rock documentaries. Um, you know, not high-budget stuff um, about... And there's this one series. It's called... 
Oh, hang on. Let me think of try to sure. remember the name. It's like um, the rise of metal on the Sunset Strip or something like that. Okay. Okay. So it, it's all about Guns N' Roses and uh, Dokken and uh, Motley Crue oh. and all these bands that, that played the whiskey – uh, mainly the whiskey, but the Sunset Strip in the early 80s, mid 80s, whatever that was. And one of them, and I had no idea, was Striper. That they were a part of that whole crew of Guns N' Roses. And um, Motley Crue was already on their way, but right. Guns N' Roses and Dokken. And all and all these other bands that I had no idea Striper <laughs> came out of that whole Sunset Strip crowd right, from exactly. the from the eighties exactly. And I saw that documentary and I was just blown away by that. It was I had no idea, <laughs> not a clue, that they were a product of that of that environment. They were they were. As a matter of fact, I saw a um, a flyer on the computer. Um, that they opened for Metallica in 19, I think it was 84. Uh, yeah. So now, granted, I don't think the crowd was there for Striper. Okay. I don't think they were. I think I'm sure they were there for Metallica. Striper tour with, Anthra with Anthrax. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, Striper threw Bibles to the crowd. They threw it back at them. That's what happened, you know? <laughs> and, right? uh, and, and Anthrax, uh, what's a guy named Scott Ian? He was kind of a mini interview. He was kind of like, why are we touring with these people? Maybe it was a special uh, show, I believe, in yeah. in California. It was it was near uh, Sunset Strip, but I can't remember exactly you know exactly where. But um, just very quickly about Striper, I've met these guys four times, meet and greet four times, mm -hmm. and uh, Michael Sweet is left handed, by the way, right? Um, but he plays guitar plays right handed, right -handed yeah. you know, right handed. Robert. Uh, Man, these these guys are nice. They're really cool. I had my Puerto Rico T shirt. It had all this neon color, you know, and glitter and stuff. He goes, I like that shirt. You know, <laughs> he just was just admiring, you know, of that stuff. And uh, of course, they signed uh, um, one that they did was called. Uh, oh my goodness, oh, gee, don't be my age, people. <laughs> um, uh, they did cover songs. Yeah. Striper did cover songs. They did. Um, they did uh, Carry On Wayward Son by Kansas. Oh, nice. They did uh, Little Trooper, Iron Maiden. I think that's what it's called. Did I say that right? The Trooper. The Trooper, excuse me. The Trooper. Um, they did a Dio, Ronnie James Dio song. Um, <sighs> Last in Line, I believe oh, that's what it nice. was, which was really, really cool. And I'm trying to think of the name of the album, but I can't think <laughs> of it. By golly, when this show ends, now is when it's going to come to me. <laughs> of course. Never, it <laughs> never, never fails. But Michael Sweet has a voice like <clears throat> no other. And yet, he never loses that voice. He just has that kind of like, ah, that kind of that, 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 that scream. But it's not that he is screaming to the audience. It's not that. It's just that, that it's just a high voice. Pitch. Yeah, he can project. So you Phen know, phen phenomenal, phenomenal band. Great regrets. Cool. So yeah. I, I, you know, hadn't really listened or heard of these guys in, in a long time. So yesterday, when word came down about the show, um, first thing I did was I hopped on YouTube, and there's a clip on there. They were on one of the big rock cruises in the last couple of years. I don't know if it was last year or the year before. I know it was the Monsters of Rock cruise or Ship Rocked or wh whatever. And they're on the deck of the boat, and there's, you know, the thousands of people on the on the boat, you know. And I was really amazed how good they sounded. And this was shot with a cell phone, and it sounded just like I remember when I was a kid listening to their records. Right. And I was like, wow, these guys are really good. And I know they tour a lot because, you know, I know – um, you know, they came back through Dallas maybe in the early spring or something to right. Gas Monkey Live. Yeah, yeah. And um, it, it was uh, when we got uh, word yesterday, I was actually driving and, and uh, got the word, hey, um, they want you, uh, you know, playing uh, support over there at Gas Monkey for Striper. I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Cool. Awesome. It'll be, it'll, be, it'll be really fun to do. So, Did you, by the way, did you hear what happened with Oz Fox? 
um, this was about a few weeks ago. Um, he collapsed. He uh, they were they were performing in Vegas. He collapsed on stage, and uh, right towards the end of the show, um, he went to the hospital, and the doctors revealed that he had a couple of tumors. Ooh, one in the back of his brain in that area. Um. And from what I understood, from what I understand, uh, Striper canceled some shows um, and they thought that he was going to be out for a long period of time. Um, but I, if I'm not mistaken, I might not have my sources correctly here, but if I'm not mistaken, um, I think he is back with the band now. He's doing better. Um, he can't drive for a few months. Um, just literally. Um, yeah. Uh, like I said, he had a tumor back in here. He had, wow, sur he had surgery done. Um, it really, it, it really is. I mean, to think that, you, you know, I mean, anything could strike, you know, uh, somebody, some well-known, um, artist, uh, anytime. at, 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 at yeah. any time, you know, so that was a, a pretty scary moment there. That is kind of so, crazy. But, uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, they're back now. He's back, and uh, so they're going to be doing shows. And um, like I said, I I am I like Striper not just because they're a Christian band, you know, because I'm not very religious, and they're not religious. They're they they say that they're not, but uh, musically, just like a secular rock band, just co they're comparable to a secular rock. Oh, absolutely. Band, you know, their music is just phenomenal. And when I was at um, the Granada Theater. There was this one guy that came all the way from the Swiss Alps just to see Striper. Dallas, wow. Which is just amazing, you know. That's cool. So, anyway, um, so you're in the ticket with the uh, for next month, right? Yes. I'm sorry, if, if I, right, for next, so, um, along, I'm sure, with plenty of others, with Striper. Yes. So, it's... Um... Dark Avenue, Millennial Rain, and Striper uh -huh. on October 16th. Right. And then, obviously, again, this Sunday, <laughs> I want to get everybody's name. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying right. to make sure we give credit to everybody because this right. is going to be a great show. Um, so, Sunday, obviously, Dark Avenue and Eve to Adam. Right. And Waves of Chaos and Westbound Revival. Right. If you don't have your tickets yet, if you go to darkavenueband.com slash tickets.html or dark avenue band just go to our shows page on dark band.com get your ticket there it'll save you some bucks from at the door and uh helps you know it helps support local music um by coming out to the show on sunday night and uh it's going to be a great one and if you've never seen a show at gas monkey whether it's bar and grill or bar or, or live across the street it's an awesome venue to see shows um and sunday's going to be a great one again Dark Avenue Band, just go to our shows tab. You'll see the ticket link right there. Go grab you a ticket. They're like 10 bucks plus, you know, if you got a credit card, you're, you yeah. know, whatever they tack on for that. Right. It's super cheap, and we'd love to see you out there. If you do come out, please come up to the merch booth after the show and come hang with us. We always like to go and hang out by our merch booth afterwards and meet anybody who wants to come up and talk to us and, and, and meet us. Well said, my friend. <laughs> All right. <laughs> really, really cool. Well, well said. So, again, Dark Avenue, this this coming Sunday, Gas Monkey Bar and Grill, three other bands at hand, which also would include Eve to Adam. Sunday night, 7 o'clock, and I am going to assume that you guys are kicking it off. No, we are the main support. So, uh, first band comes on at eight. Okay. Uh, we would go on, yeah, probably roughly. I'm going to say nine fifteen ish. Okay. For those that are tardy to the party, <laughs> uh, you heard that, folks. We would have... <laughs> nine fifteen and twenty five seconds. No. Yes. Yeah, so we would prefer it <laughs> if you're there at seven when doors open. There you go. But um, yeah, so it's um, Westbound Revival, Waves of Chaos, then Dark Avenue, and then Eve to Adam. Wow. And uh, and. Seven Dust is across the street, but you would have time to come see us and potentially still go see Seven Dust in Clutch if, you know, because they, we have, you know, big yeah. competition going on that night. Not right. really competition, but there's two major shows at Gas Monkey. There's right. our show, and then there's the Seven Dust and Clutch show. But you would have plenty of time to come see us if you really had your heart set on seeing Seven Dust, you could come see us and still catch those guys. Wow. 
you just have to be quick. <laughs> and, at least it's close. It's literally yeah, it's close. across it's, the street. It, across the street, folks. <laughs> and again, darkavenueband.com. Go to the shows tab. Click on tickets. Get your ticket through Dark Avenue because we save you money from buying them at the door. Day of the show, it's going to save you probably six, eight bucks. That's a beer. Yeah, exactly. Or another type of right. beverage. Or it, it will save it will save you just so that you can get two beers. Exactly. <laughs> there, you know, or yeah, or more, or more. And it's Sunday Fun Day. Yeah, exactly. And the other cool thing, yes, it's Sunday night for all you fuddy duddies. That, <laughs> oh, it's a school night. Well, also, also but, people leaving church. Remember? Yes. You, know, you might see them in their church outfit. I'm not. I don't know. <laughs> because it's Sunday night, they don't. The the shows end early. If you come see us, like I said, we're going to go on 9.15-ish. You can be at home by 10.30, okay? <laughs> In time for watching, you know, Sports Center or whatever else, or Friends or whatever you watch on Sunday right. night before you go to bed. Exactly. You got plenty I'll- of time to come see us and still get home at a reasonable hour. Well, you heard that, folks. People do have a ritual on a Sunday. <laughs> Sometimes they do. Sometimes, sometimes I don't remember they, what they call the sports show after the ten o'clock news on Sports, uh, sports Central. Sport, yeah, just a bunch of. Where uh, are we going? We talk about how bad the Cowboys did that day. And blah, oh blah, yeah, blah. that exactly. You know, you know what's funny when you said about the Cowboys in my acting classes. One guy said, "You Cowboys won." Yeah. <laughs> and then I and then I was about to say, although I didn't say it, I said, "Well, they didn't play to their potential, despite the fact they beat the Giants. What twenty to thirteen? I think it was." So what? What did that? Uh, so so defensively they were fantastic, but offensively what? Eh, they were no good. You know. Now everybody gets crazy. You tell the die. Don't tell the diehard fans about that because they're <laughs> going to say they're Super Bowl bound and they're going to win the Super Bowl this year, even before the season started. But I'm blunt. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell you right now. Will the Cowboys? Will the Cowboys make the playoffs this year? Yes. They will lose in the first round and they will not make the Super Bowl. There you go. There is my two cents worth. I knew, uh, look, the Cowboys back then in the 90s, they were a dynasty. But are they a dynasty now? When was the last time they won the Super Bowl? Folks, you got to look into that. Oh, but I'm not a diehard fan. I know they're going to do it this time. I predict to win the toilet bowl. <laughs> you just flushed the Cowboys down the toilet, my friend. You, liter- you literally you literally used the toilet bowl cleaner. <laughs> On the uh, the the t- uh, America's like, team, uh, Jerry Jones, are you listening right now? <laughs> now let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! On that on that brilliant note, that wonderful brilliant note, I would like to thank Barry once again. Thank you for having me, Dave. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, my friend. You bet. For coming Anytime. in. Hey, we'll do it again. I love coming in. Uh, we'll do it again one of these days again. Uh, perhaps uh, the next show will be uh, Skype, so we could have people come in, or you know, just awesome. come on and uh, you know, just have a have a chat uh, with Barry of Dark Avenue, and whoever else uh, will be here uh, next time. Uh, we'll have a uh, particular subject uh, related to music, and uh, we'll <laughs> driving just, class yeah, or driving, or it could be driving, <laughs> could be offensive, defensive. It could go into sports. It can go. Off on a tangent. There we go. Because that's how my rock show is, basically, anyway. So, all right. Approaching the top of the hour. Once again, you're listening to KDUX Web Radio, broadcasting live from Richland College, Dallas, Texas. This is The Rock Shop with Dave the Shockwave.